What is up, everybody? Thank you so much for tuning into another episode of Rocket Vlogs. Some of you may know that I'm a bit of a high power rocketry history buff, and um, I like to talk about things that happened in the past a lot, whether it's here on my channel or on the Anti Gravity Group podcast. Podcast you can find anywhere you find podcasts or by visiting the Anti Gravity Group YouTube channel. It's a good plug, right? Anyway, I wanted to take a moment to dive into some historic rocket flights because we covered this a little bit on the Anti-Gravity Group podcast, but I thought it would be fun to make a quick little video over here talking about some iconic flights that formed my childhood obsession with building and flying giant rockets. I did a live stream where I talked about these and figured I would just do my best noise critical impression, if you know who that is, and uh, fire off a little intro here and dive straight into talking about some historic rocket projects. Uh, I don't know what to say. Let's do it. So the first project I want to talk about is Wedge Oldham's 107% scale Black Brant 2. Um, this rocket was flown in 2004 and is actually going to be the newest rocket on this list today, which is pretty crazy because it's 18 in, or 18 and a half inches in diameter and uh, almost 30 feet tall. Wedge Oldham, if you're not familiar, is uh, an icon in the world of big giant rockets. He built this thing. He had giant Nike Hercules and a bunch of other just monumental, insane projects throughout the early 2000s. And I guess I believe the late 90s. I don't entirely know. But uh, this one stands out as one of my favorites because I'm just a big Black Brant enthusiast, but it also just goes unbelievably hard for how big of a rocket it is. So 107% scale, like I said, is a little bit over full scale. Um, the propellant was made by Darren Wright, the rocket obviously built by Wedge Oldham, and the hardware was built or made by uh, Jeff Taylor, who is the original founder and owner of Loki Research. And it flew on three six inch P motors for a total of over 135,000 Newton seconds and put it at 65% Q impulse. This is in 2004, 65% Q, a cluster of three six inch P motors. And uh, it was, <laughs> as as you might expect, fast. Um, it was supersonic. In fact, an 18 and a half inch rocket weighs hundreds and hundreds of pounds. And it went beyond the speed of sound and went 18,000 feet, 18,000 feet. A rocket that big going that high and that fast is insane by today's standards. But in 2004, this was 21 years ago, over 21 years ago, absolute insanity. It actually went so fast that the fins fluttered and portions of the fins came off. The website says 30% of the fins were lost, um, but it kept trucking on obviously and then made it all the way up there it had a late apogee charge so one of the tubes got a little bit damaged but other than that the rocket was recovered so i mean just an insane insane project and uh there's lots of really cool pictures and footage of it still available at blackbrant2.com that's the number two instead of spelling it out but the website's still up so uh i highly advise that you go check it out because it is insane. Porthos and Porthos 2, a rocket by the Gates brothers. And there's a little bit of a backstory necessary here, but I could literally talk about the Gates brothers and their projects for hours. Those who are unaware, the Gates brothers, Dirk and Eric Gates, were around in the early 2000s. Uh, Dirk Gates was a um, sort of a dot com bubble uh, millionaire, is really the best way to put it. So they had quite a lot of funding for pulling off some pretty insane projects and Porthos was a 12 inch diameter rocket well it's 11 and a half inch which is also true of our 12 inch punisher um it's 11 and a half inch tubing that's just the standard side size everybody rounds up at that point it's 11 and a half inches in diameter it's about 16 feet tall it has a 98 millimeter motor mount with six 54 millimeters around it and this thing flew a bunch and this is sort of a crazy thing for a rocket this big is most big projects wind up in storage or torn down for pieces for another big project but porthos was a repeatedly flying machine they flew it on uh n2000 and 6k 250s which is pretty asinine to begin with one of our favorites ever the m 2500 and 6k 1100s just all blue thunder all on the ground 
There's an amazing video of it from Rockets Magazine uh, out at Potter. I think LDRS 28 out in New York. Just insane acceleration. And uh, if you've ever heard us talking about like the screaming sound that a bunch of big motors lighting at once does, this is one of the best examples of it, that all blue thunder flight. A little more background on the Gates brothers. Eric Gates, unfortunately, passed away, I think, in 2008 or 2007. I can't really remember which one. But uh, after that, Dirk lost interest in, you know, the hobby, which is totally fair. But he did fly Porthos one more time on an N3300 and 6K1275, which is just gnarly. Um, but that, believe it or not, was not even as crazy as Porthos got because there was Porthos 2, which was a second booster or fin can. I'm going to talk about that for a second. Booster is the word for a two stage rocket, the first stage of a two stage rocket. I don't know. I used to call the, like the fin section or the lower section of a rocket a booster as well. Somebody pointed out to me that that's not really correct because it's not a two stage. And since then, that has been ingrained in my mind. So just know that if you call it a booster, I'm not going to take offense to it. But I do think it's wrong every time. Call it whatever you want. I just wanted to make that point. Anyway, they built another one. And this one was a little bit more. No, not even a little bit. A lot more insane. It had six outboard 98s and a six inch motor mount in the middle. 152 millimeter if that sounds like it's not going to fit in a 12 inch tube you that's you're you're hearing correctly i don't know what else to say you're correct it doesn't but the 98 millimeter tubes are basically pods grafted onto the outside of the tube and the gage brothers had a a corvette bodywork guy that did a bunch of fiberglass work for them that would sort of make all these things happen one of my favorite things is there's like three sixteenth inch G10 fins on all of them. But if you look at the rockets in person, they're like half an inch thick. And that is all just fiberglass in there, just built all the way up to that level of thickness, which is absolute insanity, but not quite as much insanity as Porthos 2's flights. It only did two, one on a central Aerotech N2000 and six Aerotech N4800 Blue Thunders. Now... If you're hearing that and thinking, what is an N4800 Blue Thunder? You can't be faulted because pretty much nobody ever had them. And I have reason to suspect that they only existed for the Gates Brothers. Like they were developed by Aerotech at the request of the Gates Brothers. I don't really know if that's entirely the truth or how that all worked. And I would love to have some input from Aerotech or anybody who uh, has the... The down low on that but effectively they were 98 millimeter blue thunder end motors um i believe they were like bonded into the liner directly and the last foot or 18 inches of the propellant was a finisil grain and then there was one big core burner grain on top of that uh if you dig really really hard you can actually still find the drawings for that motor the aerotech used to have you know, they have all their assembly drawings and everything on their website. It used to still be up there, which is pretty crazy to think about. But uh, yeah, insane Blue Thunder and motor and six of them all at once. Um, apparently, there was uh, some issue with this flight and didn't quite go down how it was planned to. But, you know, the rocket survived to fly another day. But yeah, I've heard... Uh, both ways that with enough money aerotech will make you one and from what i'll call more reliable sources that uh certain aerotech employees or not necessarily employees but kind of people running the show have said they'll never ever make another one ever so i guess money talks and if you have the kind of money to throw at uh an N4800 or 6 or 12 or whatever amount you have to buy to make it happen, then please 
Uh, let us know how that goes. Anyway, the second flight of Porthos 2 is where it just got insane. Like, <laughs> we fly big rockets, and some of our friends fly really big rockets, but this is next level. This thing weighed 600 pounds on the pad, loaded with a P-10,000 made by Animal Motorworks in the middle, and six Animal Motorworks N-4000 blue baboons around it. All blue baboon, a six inch and six four inch motors. Um, I should have done the math on that impulse, but I didn't. What I can tell you is that this rocket went 25,000 feet. 25,000 feet. It weighed 600 pounds. That is insane. Just absolute insanity. It's crazy. And the crazy part about that is both iterations, Porthos and Porthos 2, both still exist and they're both still flyable and fine. They now belong to my good friend Bryce Chanis, who uh, sort of owns the whole Gates Brothers rocketry estate at this point. Um, and he flies them. It's been a while, but he flew Porthos at uh, LDRS 39 in Bonneville. And it was awesome. And uh, he's flown there upscale aerotech sumo a few times as well a couple times i don't really know how many times but uh yeah so they're still around um so we got to talk bryce into flying those things more but ultimately porthos is the reason our 12 inch punisher exists uh me taylor shane and matt or i mean it's really the reason the anti-gravity group exists because Taylor was just upset, just as obsessed with the Gates Brothers stuff as I was when we were young. And we both spent countless, probably days worth of time on the Gates Brothers rocketry website. Um, just looking at stuff. It's insane. Next on the docket, Ricky Rockets Jurassic Kick. And if you're of a certain age, you probably hear that name and think of the drummer from Poison the hair metal band or i don't know people take offense to that term lately hair metal is kind of just what poison was but i i have no ill will i've listened to plenty of poison in my life but uh yeah ricky rocket the drummer from poison not a coincidence it's the same guy uh he flies rockets which is pretty crazy uh he hasn't for a really really long time but uh there's a really great interview with him in an old extreme rocketry magazine issue that i have a copy of and i'm super excited about it um but he had like a giant big Bertha. He kind of just ordered the entire public missiles catalog in the early 90s or somewhere about. It's pretty nuts. But this one was exceptionally nuts uh, because it was built with 22 and a half inch diameter drum workshop kick shells, kick drum shells. So 22 and a half inch diameter rocket and they were all stacked end to end. Uh, and I think it was about 19 feet tall. So... I, I guess the story goes that it was a size that wasn't selling well and that Ricky just kind of asked if he could take them because he was sponsored by Drum Workshop at the time. Um, and they built a rocket out of them and they flew it on a Cosden O10,000. Really long 98 millimeter O motor. And uh, there is actually a video of it floating around on YouTube that I think, I think was maybe Kai Michelson's. It might be a Rocket Man video. I can't remember for sure, but it is uh, a really entertaining video. It looks like they set up just a private launch for this thing to fly, which I don't blame them because it's uh, a little bit unique in its uh, form. But yeah, Ricky Rocket, the drummer for Poison. Okay, this next one's Downright Ignorant. That's what the Rocket's called. It's called Downright Ignorant. Um, and fair. It makes... I don't know if there's a more applicable name for this thing to be honest with you let me crack a diet ddp if anybody uh has any connects at diet dr pepper let me know okay downright ignorant dennis lamonth chuck sackett and mike ward built this rocket 24 inches in diameter 34 feet tall and on the pad it weighed 800 pounds 800 pounds it flew on a research o motor five energon l1100s and six no eight sorry eight isp k1100s and if those brands don't sound very familiar to you again 
you're not going to be faulted because this happened in 1992. This 800 pound, 30 foot tall rocket flew in 1992 at Balls 2. I think back then it was still called Fireballs 2, but downright ignorant almost seems like an undersell at that point. Okay, the, it gets even crazier if you can believe that. Um, it used a J motor to separate the nose cone at Apogee. A J motor. Not a big black powder charge, but an entire J motor. I think it was a J415, or maybe it was a J135. I can't remember. I need Taylor's uh, Taylor's input on that one. But apparently when the J motor burned out, <laughs> the, the fin can of the rocket was still going, you know, still ascending. So it just coasted and smashed right through the upper section after the J motor ejection charge burned out and uh, did some damage to it. But well, I'm just insane. 1992. People don't fly rockets that big now. And O five L's and eight K 1100s, which, by the way, were Blue Thunder and did go on to become the Aerotech K 1100 ISP industrial solid propulsion is still around and i think is um i don't know anymore isp was i believe the parent company that owned rcs and aerotech i don't know now if carmen owns isp rcs and aerotech if they're all under that or if carmen owns isp and isp is still the parent who knows i don't but uh it is the k1100 the isp k1100 so we're still flying those things today so that's how long those have been around in case you were curious okay I, that's pretty much all I got for you for giant rocket projects. It's just a, it's a good place to stop, but I know there are many, many more. And I hope a lot of rocket historians, people that have been around for a long time, hop in the comments here and let me know what I forgot and what I got wrong, because I really want to know. But more importantly, if people like this video a lot, I would like to do more of them. So let me know what historic projects I'm missing. We've talked about this on an episode of the Anti-Gravity Group podcast before, but uh, I think we've done two, actually. But there's always more cool rocket stuff to learn. I have a couple cool guests um, who were there for it all and partook in it all, lined up for the Anti-Gravity Group podcast in coming months, hopefully, that can talk our ears off about some legendary flights and stuff like that. So press the subscribe button and uh, leave a like and tell me what I got right and wrong and what I'm missing in the comments. But give me a second here to plea. Grab your friends, pool some money, start swiping credit cards without looking at the statements and build a big giant rocket, please. You can disregard the credit card advice. That's really bad advice. But what I would like you to do is step into the world of big giant rockets. I know altitude and speed is super, super fun, but I just miss this era of giant stuff every year for ever. Giant, giant rockets were coming to LDRS, balls especially, NSL, just stuff like huge, huge group projects. And uh, it seems, seems like that's sort of gone the way of the wind in lieu of composite stuff going way high and way fast the mass availability of carbon fiber and fiberglass rocket parts made altitude and speed way more attainable and it just kind of pushed out the world of big rockets but we miss it so let me know in the comments and uh thanks for watching